Father. Good evening, happy Wednesday. A little cold outside, a little rainy, but that's all right, because cause the showers are gonna bring the flowers, amen. <laughs> Weeping may endure for a, for a morning, but joy comes, or, or for, weeping may endure for a season, but joy comes in the morning. Did I say that right? By God's grace. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. There's wisdom in the multitude of, sorry, I'm just going to stop. I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm just going to stop. Well, uh, thank you uh, for those that are in the room and for those watching online. Uh, super excited to get into uh, the topic for today. Uh, but before we begin with the topic, we're going to start off with a word of prayer. Then we're going to sing some songs of praise. And then we're going to go into a season of prayer, and then we will jump into it. So let's start off with the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you so much. Um, I want to thank you for the rain outside, as it is a reminder of the showers of blessings that you continue to pour upon our lives. I pray that you may allow us to be in a position in which we can receive them. I pray that you may continue to work in our lives, guide us, lead us, protect us as I know you have. And now, Father, as we enter into a time of worship, a time of praise, I pray that our hearts may be softened to receiving of the word. I pray that you may use this as an opportunity to allow us to reflect on your goodness, on your faithfulness to us, that when we sing these songs, Father God, our hearts may be lifted up to you. Lord God, we thank you because you're good, you're merciful. And your mercy endures forever. We pray this on Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. So I, I kind of I heard this song being sung or being played in the background. It was Trust and Obey 590. Trust and Obey. Ah. Uh. 
interesting i like that i like the order that it has that it has it in it yeah it, it's it's nice and even even just the title itself it's like you know it's not obey and trust it's trust and obey and there's an aspect of of trusting leading to obedience and 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 so you can see that even in the in the hymn so that was beautiful thank you for singing along the next song uh that we can sing is 569 it was another song I was kind of playing in the sanctuary background. It just got stuck in my head. Huh? Old school, Old school yeah. <laughs> 569.
to sing. If not, 530 is always a go-to for me. But if anybody else has any thoughts, speak now or forever hold thy peace. Yep, 530 it is. 530. Huh? Practice. time um, we're going to go into a season of prayer 
So I encourage you either to get with somebody or to just be by yourself, uh, whether you're online or in the room. Uh, find somebody in, a, in another room or connect with somebody if you can. If you can't, just pray by yourself. And then I'll, I'll bring us in uh, to jump into the Word. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you. Um, we want to thank you because you're good, because you're merciful. We want to thank you because we went through a week, and Father God, you brought us to this moment, a moment where we can take time to sing praises, praises that um, are due to you, but praises that also set us free from the different things that have been holding us this week. And God, as we come into this moment, I pray that there may be an opportunity for us to reconnect with you in a mighty and a powerful way. So that as we connect with you, God, we may experience change. So we invite you to join us as we dive into scripture. That you may be the one that presents it to our hearts. And that it's your spirit, the one that brings conviction and transformation. Is our prayer and our plea, Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.
Okay, so uh, for those of you um, that don't know um, here or online, uh, our church is going through a series currently, and the series is called Equip to Live, Equipping for Living. And the idea behind it is that God wants to equip us in every single good work. He wants us to be ready and prepared for everything that we're going to face. So he wants us to be equipped when it comes to ministry, when it comes to church and our participation in church. And uh, by God's grace, we had an amazing time uh, this past Sunday, uh, this past Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, doing a series on how to preach, a workshop on how to preach. And so this is just one aspect of how God wants to equip us. He wants to equip us when it comes to spiritually speaking, but he also wants to equip us emotionally speaking. So he sets up different ap- opportunities for us to be able to grow in this way, uh, uh, emotionally speaking, whether that's in relation to our marriages, whether that's in relation um, to our mental health, whether it's in relation to the way we communicate and talk to uh, other people. God wants us to be equipped and to learn how to be better at doing those things, right? But not just emotionally, but also there's a practical aspect to it, right? He wants us to be uh, equipped Uh, financially speaking, understanding how to utilize our resources. God wants us to be equipped when it comes to even uh, maybe uh, uh, some some basics when it comes to how to operate and work our vehicles, whether it's changing a tire or um, maybe even changing some oil. God creates opportunities for us to be able to learn these type of things. And so that's what we're kind of doing this month is just a bunch of different things when it comes to equipping, uh, just giving opportunities for people to grow. Really, that's what it, that's what it is. And so um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the message that we started off was, uh, who's the teacher? And we talked a little bit about uh, who is the teacher? Are we the teacher or is, or is, you know, is God the teacher, the Holy Spirit the one that teaches us? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the one that teaches us. Our job is to be the students, correct? And so last time during prayer meeting, we learned what our number one priority is. Do you guys remember what the number one priority is? I feel bad. The people in the room got to say something. The people online are like, who is it? Uh, Do you guys remember what the number one priority is? Get with Jesus, right? The number one priority is is to be with Jesus, to be in his presence, to spend time with him. That is our number one priority. That's, that, that's if, 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 you're, if you are a student in a school and somebody can give you the secret sauce to passing the class, the number one thing you got to do is be with the teacher. Don't, 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 don't leave the teacher. Don't separate. You have to be with the teacher. And so uh, I, I, I've been thinking and praying and trying to figure out what to do for a prayer meeting. And I thought we would um, go through some classes. We're going to go through a little bit of classes and we're just going to tackle different topics and I mean, mind you, there's a million different ways we could tackle these, these subjects. This is just the angle that I felt like the Spirit was leading on. So, so if, if there's any thoughts or comments that, come, that pop up along the way, feel free to mention them uh, and whatnot. But this is the direction we're going to go. So the first class we're going to take is um, Humility 101. Humility 101. This is the first class that we're going to take. So it's interesting because when you read the Bible, uh, it talks a lot about humility. So much about humility. And, 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 and the way you know it talks a lot about humility is not just by looking up every time the Bible says humility, but also every time the Bible uses the opposite, pride, right? So when you go through the Bible and you see this contrast between pride and humility, pride and humility, there's this battle that you see all throughout the scriptures, even in parables, when Jesus breaks down some parables, we see that Jesus talks about this, this contrast, pride, humility, pride, humility, humbling yourself. And I just want to go through a couple texts that talk about uh, humility, just so we get a little bit of an understanding as to uh, 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 what it may look like. And so uh, the first one is Proverbs chapter 22, verses 4, and it says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor of life. So when somebody is humble, when somebody fears the Lord, there are riches and honor and life in doing those things. Uh, And then going to the next verse in Proverbs chapter 11, verses 2, it says, When pride comes, then comes shame. But with 
the humble is wisdom. And so here we see a little bit of this contrast between pride and humility. Pride bringing shame and humility bringing wisdom. And then in James chapter 4, verses 6, we see it again. It says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the who? To the humble. So again, there's this battle and this contrast where, 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 where uh, God is wanting to give grace, but he says God is resisting the proud, or he's, he, he, there's, there's, there's tension between God and the proud, but there's grace that is given to the humble. And then in James chapter 4, verse 10, uh, we see this, this humility again. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will do what? He will lift you up. And in Proverbs chapter 18, verses 12, uh, this is a verse that we may be familiar with, right? Before, before, destruction, be, before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty, and before honor is humility. This is the idea where we get where, you know, pride comes before the fall, right? Before the destruction of the heart takes place, there's, there's, there's haughtiness, there's pride. And before uh, this honor takes place, there's humility. So if we're, if, we're, if we're eager for the destruction of the heart, you know, pride may be the, the route that you want to take. But if you're interested in the honor, humility is the route to take. And then there's um, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6. It says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And I love that it says in due time, right? It's like there's a, there's a period. It says in due time, God will exalt you. And so all throughout scripture, we see that there's this contrast between humility and between pride, between haughtiness and humbleness. And so uh, my question is, why is humbleness such an important part when it comes to to following God? Why is being humble so important? Why is this one of the biggest lessons that is taught? Or what is this one of the wisdom counsels, one of the most wisdom, one of the most wisdom counsels? One of the counsels that is most recommended in, in all of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes is this idea of humility. Why is that such an important topic? because we're supposed to rely on God. So, so, so pride prevents us from relying on God. Hum, humility or humbleness uh, uh, encourages us to rely on God. Okay, I like that. It's because Christ-like, straight up. If we follow in God, if we're being made in his image, Christ is humble. So we have to follow in those footsteps of Christ being humble. I like that. We're going to expound on that a lot. Any other thoughts? It's the opposite of being self-centered. So pride is this huge focus on self, and, and, and humility is this focus on others, on, focused on people around you, focused on, on, on the outward. Okay, I like that, I like that. Might touch on that a little bit too. Uh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna share some thoughts that came to my mind when I when I asked this question because this is a question that popped up in my head. Um, some of the things that, that that popped up in my head was pride makes you think that you're God, and that you could provide for yourself. Like when when someone's prideful, there's this idea that I can I can handle this, I can work this out. Kind of going to you like this this resisting God like hey I got this, and 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 or maybe even a desire to be in that position. And we may think of the story of Adam and Eve, right, uh, in the garden, this idea of like, oh, I can be like God. Like, hey, let me try this out, right? So there's this idea of, of, of pride looking at self and what you can be, where you can go. While humility prepares us to receive. Like, like when we're humble, it allows us to be in a position to receive. But when we're, pride, when we're prideful, it puts us in a position to think that we're God and we can provide for ourselves. And so, and so, and so how can we ever get to a position where, 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 where God is trying to give to us if we're not in a position to be ready to receive it? Another one is pride thinks about, pride thinks about what other people think. Humility thinks about what God thinks. Pride thinks, what can I teach them? Humility thinks, 
what can I learn from them? And can you imagine uh, one of the things that like still blows my mind when I think about the Gospels? Um, it's not necessarily, I mean, don't get me wrong. All the things that Jesus did is like, whoa, you know, like, don't get me wrong. All that stuff is amazing. But what amazes me is that Jesus was a kid. That's what, that's what my mind tries to, you know, tries to wrap its head around. It's like, it's like, wait, Jesus was a kid? Jesus was a baby. Jesus had to learn how to speak. He had to, he had to say dad, dad, and mama, but he is probably in a Greek or, uh, they, they, they say some. They say that they they spoke Arabic back then. So he he must have, he must have had to say it a different language. But he had to learn how to say those things. Jesus had to learn. God had to learn how to walk. He 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 learned about nature from 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 the environment around him, from the word. He learned, right? And so sometimes I just wrap my head around this idea that yo God Jesus like he learned he grew up, and that's. That's intense for my mind to wrap around. So when we're talking about pride and when we're talking about humility in this contrast, and uh, this is Humility 101, right? Why is it that Jesus, when it comes to teaching others, decides not to go with uh, uh, the people that looked the best in their day and age? He didn't go with these leaders of the church, these leaders of the synagogue, but rather he found fishermen, we could spend a long time trying to answer that. But there's this passage in Matthew chapter 23 that begins to dive into it a little bit. And it's almost like Jesus, Jesus sees something that other people can't see because he sees with that divine eye. And so uh, in Matthew chapter 23, reading in verse 1, and we're going to read 1 through 3, uh, uh, Jesus, Jesus is saying something here. And he says, Then... Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples. So he's having a conversation with the disciples, speaking to the multitudes. And so he's saying this, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They, they sit down in Moses' seat. Moses was this grand leader. And so now uh, the Pharisees and the scribes are, are sitting in that same place. And so he's saying, therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do but do not do according to their works. Why do they say why does he say that? Because they say and do not do. So 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 it's interesting. Jesus here is 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 opening the scene and the first thing he opens with is is this is this is the first problem, the first issue when it comes to this topic. And there's this idea of saying but not doing. And what's interesting about this is, at least for me, is I need to learn this. <laughs> like, as I was going through this, the Lord was convicting me. He was like, saying, Samson, you like to say a lot of things. But what would happen, what would honestly happen if everything that we said was recorded and we were held accountable for it? <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is, right? Like, like everything that we say like, like, like the things that we tell somebody else, right? And, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna try to speak from, from a careful place here. But, you know, parents, what, we, what they say to their children, sometimes, sometimes we hear the phrase, do as I say, not as I do, right? But in reality, we're held accountable for the things that we tell others, right? So, so, so what's scary is this, and this is, this, is, this is what God was kind of convicting me of as I was going through this journey. It's like, Samson, you're preaching every weekend. You're doing Bible studies. You're over here doing, doing, doing uh, 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 midweek prayer meetings. You're getting a lot of this stuff. Let's slow down and let's review. Let's, let's go over some of this stuff in our hearts. Let's make sure that we're not, because, uh, you know, I can learn the lesson today and forget it tomorrow. But making sure it's, it's, it, it's getting ingrained. And so, and so the issue that's taking place here is, is there's a group that's falling in love with saying stuff, but not being held accountable for it. And so pride thinks, what can I teach? What can I teach this other person? How, like, like, what can I teach this person? Let, 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 me, let me tell this person what to do. 
let me tell this person how to move. Could be a, a friend, could be a family member, a spouse. It could be people at work. It could be people here in the sanctuary at church. But this idea of saying, like, well, what can I tell this person to do? What can I, well, let, me, let, me, let me push this person, let me lead this person, let me guide this person. And we're so focused on doing that, that we lose sight of, are we listening to that advice ourselves? Because humility asks the question, what can I learn from this person? What can I learn from this person? So this is the scene that's being set up uh, for the disciples as Jesus is talking. So he's saying, look, he's like, don't do according to their works, though, because they, they're, not, they're not hitting it. Because they say something, and they do something completely different. And so Jesus continues to go into that, uh, reading in verses uh, Reading in verses 4, it says, for, their, for, their, for, their, for they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and then they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move with one of their fingers. And then verse 5 says, but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their, how do you say it? phylacteries. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. Verse 6, they love the best places at the feasts and the best seats in the synagogues. Greetings in the marketplaces and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. So, so Jesus, when he's, when he's telling the disciples and, and the multitudes, he's having this conversation with them. He's saying, look, these guys, they love to sit in the best places. They love to eat at the best houses. They like to, do the best. They like to go in the streets and greet people and be called Rabbi, Rabbi. It makes them feel all good. They like to be seen by who? Who is it that they like to be seen by? They like to be seen by men. And so... With this, the question we have to ask ourselves is, do, do we enjoy being seen by men? And this is, this is, this is a tough one. It is, because uh, for many of us, we fall into the area of it's like, you know, I have to, I have to, get, I have to, get, the, the, I have to get this car. Like, I have to get this new one. I have to get this one because, because I need people to see that I'm doing well out here. I don't want to drive around in, in, in a rusty bucket vehicle. You know, and so, and so we have this idea of like being seen by men. We got we to gotta look a certain way. There's this idea of I, I have to get this certain job. And, and if I don't get this job, then people are going to think that maybe God's on my side. People are going to think this. People are going to think that. And we get obsessed with what people think. When it comes to that. And that's what I'm saying. Like, like yeah, you could, you could be driving this, this, this bad car and be filled with joy from the Lord, saying, like, look, God taking care of me. It doesn't matter what other people are thinking. But we get caught up sometimes. We get caught up thinking, uh, maybe uh, I need to have this type of spouse or my kids or my grandkids need to be a certain way. And, and, and I don't want people to think bad of me. I don't want the family name to be ruined. Or, or, you know, I have to have this role in church. And if I don't have this role in church, I feel like people won't think highly of me. I need to be in this position. I have to, you know. <laughs> and, and, and what's funny is, and this is, this, is, this is tough, right? Because for many of us, we don't, we don't sin, not necessarily because we have a deep love for God, but because we're afraid that if we get caught, people might think something. And that's tough. Like, like, like for some people, uh, they, 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 may, they may pay tithes, not necessarily because they're like, oh, you know, this, this, this belongs to the Lord. It's not that mindset. It's from a mindset of, uh, I kind of know the person who keeps the books. So I got to be careful because they're going to see my name, whether it's in or out. And so even, even in the good things that we do, uh, on the outside, they're done with the worst intentions. Thinking not about what God thinks, but more specifically, what does men think? And so, and, so, and so Jesus is saying here, look, we have, to, we have to squash this. We have to squash this idea of trying to be seen by men. Because men can see what? Only the outside. But God, he knows the insides. 
He knows the depth of our hearts. He knows our motives. And so, uh, continue reading. In uh, verses 8, it says, But you do not be called rabbi, for, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one who is your father, he who is in heaven. For one is your father, he who is in the heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. And verse 11, But he who is the greatest among you. Now, now Jesus is teaching the multitudes. He's teaching the multitudes. He's teaching the disciples. He's having a conversation with them. And he's saying, hey, look, don't try to be called teachers. Don't try to be called, don't call people the teachers. Don't call people your fathers. And, and mind you, he's not, he's not saying necessarily, you know, when you go home, don't, don't say, you're not my dad. You know, I don't want anybody, I don't want anybody going home with that type of energy. Um, but what Jesus is trying to do is trying to point us to our true father, our true teacher. He's trying to point us to that direction. The truth of the matter is, yes, you know, our father at home, he's our father. But the truth of the matter is, it's God who lent you to that father. You really belong to God. He really is our father. So, so Jesus is teaching the multitudes, and he's using this language of teacher, right? And, and so when he says this phrase, uh, he who's greatest among you shall be the servant, he, he's basically saying, like, look, if you want to be the A student in the class, like if you want to, if you want to, you know, get the honor roll and, 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 and get, get a, a summa cum laude, if you're trying to, if you're trying to uh, outdo us all, if you're trying to do the, the most, you're going to be the servant. You're going to be the servant of everybody in this place. And it's like, <laughs> you got a second guess, like, wait, servant? <laughs> like if I want to, if I want to get, Summa cum laude, I got to, I got to be a servant. And then in verse 12, he says this, uh, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And, and so, and so all of this, Jesus is talking about humility. He, he's pushing the disciples, trying to teach them lessons on humility. And he uses the phrase, he who among us wants to be the greatest has to be a servant. And this isn't this isn't necessarily the um, this isn't the first scene that we see where, where where Jesus uses this type of language in Matthew chapter 18. He he, he said this again. Matthew chapter 18, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. In verse four, therefore, whoever humbles himself as his little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And number five. Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And so if, if people are wanting to be the greatest, Jesus is saying, look, you have to be as a child. You have to be as a kid. You have to be as this little one. And, 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 and what's crazy is, you know, just thinking about the idea that, yo, kids are closer to the kingdom than we are. Like the older you get, it's almost like the more you got to run, the more you have to be intentional, the more you have to be focused on saying, like, oh, I have to be like this kid. And it's specifically talking in the aspects of humility. Of humility. The older you get, the truth of the matter is, the older you get, the more you know. Like, that's, that's normal. The older you get, the more you know. You begin to learn stuff. You, you experience stuff. You see stuff that, you know, the people who, 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 who were alive 40 years ago, 50 years ago, they saw stuff that me, who, who wasn't born 30 years ago, I'll never understand. There's some things you had to be there for. But when you grow and you, and you experience life and you get older, you just you grow in knowledge, information, but you also grow in experience. You've experienced some things. But what's crazy is that knowledge and that experience can have his handicap when it comes to spirituality because all of a sudden we're not willing to listen to somebody that's younger than us because we think to ourselves they don't know anything we think to yourself and I've had somebody tell me this but they didn't tell me it in a mean way they just kind of told me in a friendly way they said hey you're 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 the same age as my grandson he told me that and I was like thanks 
<laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, I don't know. I don't know what to say. You know, but, 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 but imagine, you know, somebody could say, like, why would I listen to you? You're the same age as my grandson. Like, what do you, what do you know? But this is, this is the idea of what, 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 as we get older and older, there's all these things that we have to intentionally say, okay, it doesn't matter. What can I learn? What can I learn? And so, uh, I, I want us to go to uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, because Jesus talks about the greatest, right? He says, he uses the word the greatest, right? He says, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. he Jesus said the phrase, there is nobody greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist, he was, he was the one. He was the guy. But why was that the case? Is it because he introduced uh, or baptized Jesus? Because the truth of the matter is, if it's because he baptized Jesus, you know, I'm, I'm never going to baptize. No one's ever going to baptize Jesus. John already took that. He already took that. Why was it that John the Baptist was considered the greatest in the kingdom? Or, not necessarily in the kingdom, because it's even the least in the kingdom is as great as he. But why is, did God consider him to be, there's nobody born of women that's greater than John the Baptist. Why would he use that phrase? What's interesting is what took place in John chapter 3. Not verse 16. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is good what took place in John three sixteen, But, as you continue reading further to John chapter 3, verses 30, there's, there's something that John says that I believe uh, uh, placed him into that position. And it's here, it says, he must what? Increase, and I must what? Now, I need us to see something here, because the, 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 the storyline behind this is amazing. Uh, 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 there, there, there are these disciples that come up to John and say, like, yo, John, this guy's baptizing so many people. He's doing work out here. He's, he, he's, he's killing the game. What's going on? And, and, and John tells them, go after him. Go follow that guy. Go, go see what he's up to. Because, because look, this is, I'm not, I'm not, it's not about me. It's about him. It's not about me, it's about him. And thus he came up with this, he came up with this phrase right here. He says, I must, I must, he must decrease, or he must increase and I must decrease. And notice, he said must. He recognized something. He didn't say um, he should increase and I should decrease, right? That's what should happen. But if you guys want to follow me, that's cool too, right? <laughs> that's not what he said. He said he must he didn't say, he's going to increase and I'm going to increase. He said, he must. This is a necessity. This is, this is a necessity. This isn't another option. This has to be the way. And the question that's at hand is, is that the same for us? You know, when we go into situations and, and, and we feel a certain way, because I, I love this, because it's, and, 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 it's almost as if John is experiencing some type of battle, like, you know, because, because people were following after him into the wilderness. People were coming after him to get baptized. People were coming from all corners of, uh, 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 of the world at that time, right, to get baptized, to see John. And, and now John is taking these steps back and saying, no, it's about him. So there may be this internal battle where he's like, there's this part of him that's like, hey, but this kind of feels good. And he's like, no, 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 he must. And so the question, I guess, I'm, that's at hand is, do we say the same? You know, when, when pride begins to perk itself up in our, in our bones, when pride begins to be filled up and, and we want things to go this way, we want things to go that way, and, 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 and we want to play God in those roles and we want to make this and that happen, do we go in with the mindset? It's like, wait a second. I know I feel this pride building up, but he must increase and I must decrease. God, what is your will? God, what do you want to happen? Because as soon as that starts taking place, I mean, John was in a position where he could have been like, you know what, on second thought, come follow me real quick. I got some, I got some sermons that I, could, that I could preach. 
But said he's like, no, 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 go follow him. And that is what's beautiful. What's beautiful, and this is the ultimate of, of humility, right? Is is this aspect of not wanting people to follow you, but you wanting people to follow Christ. When you when you push people in that direction, hey, look, don't don't get me wrong. I'm I'm, I'm running after him too, but you need to run after him. You need to go after what he's telling you to do. You need to build your relationship with him. When we push people in the direction of Christ, that is what it's about. And so uh, when, we, when we're looking at Matthew chapter 23, the central focus of Matthew chapter, chapter 23 really focuses in on 25 and 26. This is where the passage has its richness. Uh, and, and so... It says here, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the dish of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortions of self-indulgence. And verse 26, it says, Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup, that the outside of them may also be clean. So when it comes to humility, humility is, only, is, is, is going to clean the inside of us. Pride is only going to focus on the outside. It's only going to focus on what other people think. It's only going to focus on getting an external pleasure. It's only going to focus externally. It's not, it's not going to do anything for us internally. But the second we humble ourselves, the second that we come to God and say, okay, God, hey, look, I need to be real with you. You already know what's going on in my heart. I, can't, I can go out there and fool every single person, but before you, I can't fool you. Humility comes before God and says, cleanse me. Do something new in my life. Take my life and let it be consecrated all to thee. That is what true humility does. Because the truth of the matter is, humility will work like this. And I've used this example before, um, but it's the example of being out in the desert, right? You're out in the desert, and you've been out there for a couple of days, and you're walking, and you see a bottle of water. Pride says, I don't need that. You know, for many of us, we're we going through a desert, and God's like, yo, come on, <laughs> what are you doing? And he's like, no, nah, I don't need that. I can go a couple more miles. You see, but, 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 but humility is this idea, this recognition of, of your condition. This recognition of where you're at. And you say, no, I need some water. And the second I see some water, I'm going to get it. And so you see the bottle of water in it, and you run over there. You, look, 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 you know, you, <laughs> just the fountain just spewing out of water. Just, just throwing your face in it. But pride, on the other hand, walk into the desert, see the bottle of water. No, I don't need that. Now watch this. Pride also, you run into somebody else. He's like, hey man, you know, I'm, I'm dying of thirst. I need to... Hey, come follow me. I'll show you some stuff. Don't even know, don't even know where you go, right? Just come on, I'll, I'll, I'll show you some stuff. Humility will say, no, no, there's, there's a fountain over there and I just, I just, I, I chugged gallons of water, bro. You're going to be good. Humility pushes in their direction. So, so when Jesus is, 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 is talking to these disciples, he's like, look, these Pharisees, they're saying something, but they're not doing it. These, these Pharisees and, and, and scribes, they're saying stuff, they're not doing it. They're, they're, they're trying to have this outer appearance of this clean cup, but they, they're struggling on the inside. And so, and so it's almost like he's begging the disciples, like, look, if you want to be the greatest... It's not about looking like these Pharisees and trying to be above people. It's about being a servant. It's about recognizing your condition, recognizing who you are. It's about recognizing that. And then going to him and getting that water, right? Getting that cleansing. It's also about taking people and, and, and taking them too. Not, not, not taking them to, to follow you into the desert of, of destruction, right? <laughs> right? It's not about that, but it's, it's, about, it's about taking them to the fountain of living waters. And allowing them to drink too. So, so when we think about our lives, even more on a practical level, um, we, could, we, could, we could think about it in the case of, 
uh, uh, how, how do we move in the midst of our families? Do we move with the mindset of saying, I want this person to come after me? Or do we move with the mindset of, I want this person to go after God? Do we move with the mindset that I'm better than, you know, my children, or I'm better than my spouse, or I'm better than my parents? Or do we move with the mindset that says, says no, I'm not, I'm not better than them. We're all, we're all on a journey to go get that bottled water in the middle of the desert. You know, we're all, we're all on that journey together. And so we encourage and we come before the Lord and say, Lord, cleanse me. Because I need a cleansing just as much as I think my parents do. I need a cleansing just as much as I think my spouse does. I'm, I need a cleansing just as much as I think my children does. I need a cleansing just as, just as much as every person in this church and online needs it. Do we move with that type of mentality? Even in the church, do we move with that type of mentality? Do we move that t- with that type of mentality when it comes to the community and connecting with people and talking with people? Or do we think when we're talking with people, this person is not a Christian and they need what I have? And so we feel a little bit better than them because we feel like we got, we got some in the back pocket, right? It's all like, so, so I believe God calls us when it comes to, when it comes to humility um, and when it comes to this topic is to really recognize our condition. Recognize our condition and take others to him. Like that's what he calls us to do in his, in his humility. I just recognize, just see it. Because your pride will blind you. Your pride will lead others astray. But if you would just set all that down and be humble and say like John the Baptist, he must, he must increase, he needs to, he has to, this has to be the way. He must increase and I must decrease. When we move with that type of mentality, God, God lifts us up. God blesses us. He honors us. He fills us with life. He fills us with riches. And he blesses us. So if this is your prayer this evening, I want you to join me in a word of prayer that God can bring us to a place of humility. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we journey through the scriptures, we kind of saw this little battle between pride and humility. But the truth of the matter is, that battle is not just in the Bible, it's in our hearts. And, 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 and we're battling, we're fighting, we're frustrated, Lord. We want people to, 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 to maybe be where we are at, but, but we can't quite recognize how, how, how naked and how miserable we are. And Father God, I'm asking for you to bless us in a mighty way with eyes salved that we can see our condition and see that even though we may be pointing our finger, Father God, there's three more pointing back and that you're calling us to come before you for that cleansing. Not to just have this clean outer cup feel, but Father God, to have that deep cleansing on the inside and help us not to have other people come after us, but Father God, to push people after you. That when people come to our families, they may say, this is a family that, 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 that upholds humility and that upholds Jesus and his character. When people walk into this church, they may say the same, that this is a church that upholds Jesus and upholds humility and that work together, that even wherever we go, whether in Tulsa or outside of it, Father God, they may notice that we uphold humility and the character of Christ. So we ask for your help. We ask for your leading. We ask for your protection, Father God, as we continue to learn more about following you. As I pray in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Hope you guys have a wonderful Wednesday. Join us on Sabbath. And next week, Tuesday, there's going to be a de-escalation seminar, 6 o'clock. That's it.